I think you're really dope with Eric Nam. All right, I'm gonna just get us started. Hey, everybody, welcome to the show. This is Eric Nam, your host, and is an author, a producer, and the Korean American J.K. Rowling. Please welcome. <laughs> Miss Jenny Han. Hello. Hi. Hey. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming. How you been? I'm great. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm great. I'm like nervous. You hear the wind outside? Y- yeah. Yeah. Just to give you guys context, uh, we, <laughs> we are in the middle of a typhoon. Literally. And uh, we're excited. Worried. We, we really want people to stay safe and be safe. But uh, today, I'm supposed to be flying out to New York. It's been delayed. Outside, it looks like the gates of hell if I knew what that looked like. It's like Lord of the Rings, you know, when yes. that, like, Eye of Sauron is starting to yes. like, spin. <laughs> it's very dark. A lot of clouds. Things are flying around. And it's supposed to hit right about now, right? Yes. And my hotel was like, do not leave after noon. <laughs> and my dad was like, don't go anywhere. And I was like, I gotta go. I gotta go hang out with Eric Nam. Do the most important yeah. podcast in the world. <laughs> Um, so thank you for risking your entire life. I'm so happy to be here. To come. Thank you so much. Um, if you hear things shattering in the background, it may be the typhoon. We'll give you guys live updates as it happens. Um, but let's just jump right into it. So Jenny, you are in Korea. Um, this is… You've been to Korea a good, good amount of times, A right? good amount of times, yeah. My right. family, a lot of my family is still here. Okay. Um, and you're here shooting the third and final part of… To all the boys I've loved before. This is yeah. to all the boys, always and forever. Lara Jean. That's okay. The title. Man, how is it? I mean, if you guys do not know about Jenny, um, she is a very accomplished author, and um, her it's a trilogy of books. It's a trilogy. To, yes, to all the boys I've loved before. That was probably it. May be like the most streamed movie on Netflix. No, it might be. Like, that's a big deal. <laughs> it's a might huge be. deal. Like, do you get those stats? Do they tell you that stuff? They are pretty… Um, I think they said something like 80 million on wow. like, the first, like, month or so. That's insane. Um, But I think we don't know specifics exactly. I think they're uh-huh. a bit more opaque with that okay, information. Okay. Um, did you expect that kind of success? No way. I mean, it was a huge surprise uh-huh. for that level. What was your reaction to it when, when you, like… Oh, I was really overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah, I was coming from, you know, the book world, which I think is much more like of an intimate Mm -hmm. space um, between you and your readers. Right. And I've been writing books um, for like 15 years. Yeah. You know, and so I like love my fans. I love the readers. We, I have book events and I go to festivals and stuff and we like interact a lot online. So it was, it's very different to suddenly overnight have like a, a way bigger audience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, before we talk more about the movie and like what you're doing in Seoul, let's let's get to know you a little more. Okay. You know, I, I tried to do a little Googling on your life and everything and there wasn't a whole lot out there. Um, and so I want to know a little bit more about Jenny Han. Like where you're from, how you grew up, your parents, what it was like growing up as a Korean American… Um, So I have some very basic stats here. Um, You were born in Richmond. That's right. Virginia. Mm -hmm. And uh, you went to UNC Chapel Hill and then the new school in New York Mm -hmm. um, for your master's. Um, And it says here that you were also a librarian. That is correct. When was this? So after I graduated the grad program, Uh um, I got that job mostly because it's… Writing can be a very solitary right. job. And I liked to be able to have three days a week where I knew I was working and I had to wake up at a certain time and be somewhere. A little like, bit of structure. Exactly. Yeah. I needed the structure. Otherwise, it could the days could kind of just like melt into each mm-hmm. other and I wasn't being that productive. Okay. Fair enough. Um, so let's talk about this. So you were you born in Richmond. Um, any siblings? One sister. One sister. Mm-hmm. Younger? Older? Younger. Okay. So you're the oldest. Parents, they immigrated to the States mm-hmm. when? In the in the late 70s. In the late 70s. Mm-hmm. What was it like growing up and living in Richmond? Um, you know, it's it's in the South. Right. Um, I actually had a quite big like Korean American community because oh, okay. of church. Uh-huh. And so I had Korean school on Saturdays and then like youth group on Sundays. Mm-hmm. So I was like super into my like group. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was, it was um, and then I was lucky enough, like in middle school, I think it was a hard time for me a bit because 
there really weren't um, many. There's only one other like Asian person in my school. Wow. And then um, so there was a fair amount of like racism and like right. microaggressions right. and stuff. And then I ended up applying to to go to a different high school where so many of my like church friends also went. Oh. And so then it was like that was like a multicultural school, and I like learned so much about other people's backgrounds too. Where I'd never like. There were, I never even got to go to a bar mitzvah. You uh-huh. know what I mean? Like, because in Richmond, there just weren't really, really wasn't much yeah. diversity in my like little subsection. Um, but then I went to high school and was like, oh, I, my friend was Sikh, and my friend was Muslim. I had like a plethora of different kinds of people. Yeah. But most of all, there were so many Korean people there. That's, I mean, that's great. I mean, I, you know, people who know me know that I was also the only Asian kid in my year uh, in high school, in middle school. And then, like, by the time we graduated, there were, like, four four Koreans. And we're, like, the only Asians in our year. And it was a very, very uh, non-diverse group of people. And so going to college and meeting all those people was, like, such an eye-opening and experience. And I think that's the case for so many yeah. um, kids from different backgrounds where it's, like, you go to college and you have that, like, awakening experience. Mm-hmm. Right? Where you kind of find your people. Right. And right, people right. who maybe didn't necessarily hang out with um, like Asian people before right. then go and you're like, wow, like there's so many people like me with a similar like story mm-hmm. and you feel like like you belong to something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What did your parents do? So my mom had a store uh-huh. and my dad um, worked at Philip Morris, which is like, um, uh, you know, Philip Morris, yeah. right? Like the tobacco. Tobacco. But then they there. also at the time owned like craft in Nabisco. Oh, cheese <laughs> and crackers. <laughs> yeah. So at like, Christmas, we used to get like a gift basket it would be like ricola and <laughs> oreos and um all kinds of good nabisco yeah. treats and then like cigarettes not cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get cigarettes no okay however i have a lot of marlboro merch uh, okay that those used to be everywhere what the merch yeah like i have like a duffel bag of this like, i'm telling you like red umbrella well before like cigarettes were like heavily regulated i yeah. still remember as a kid like I was like, what is this red and white thing that everybody has? Yes. And the camels. You remember the camels? Camels, sure. We had like camels drinking glasses. <laughs> right. Cause and I thought they were like the coolest things. And they're like Joe Camel. Yeah. They're like, you cannot advertise to kids, kids. anymore. I know it's whack. And I know that's it's whack. crazy. Yeah. It went to think about it, that's probably like 20, 30 years ago that it's like we were being advertised to. For sure. Um, as little kids. Um, so your parents, like what what was their I guess I want to get to like the traditional Korean American immigrant story. Do you feel like you really align and define yourself with that? Or do you feel like it was kind of, I guess it's a little different in middle school if you were very like the only Asian kid. And then in high school, it was a good mix. Maybe you had a good balance. Great. But I mean, I don't know because on the weekends, I was always seeing my Korean uh-huh. friends. So it know? didn't feel too like… It, in school sometimes it didn't feel great. Right. But then I felt like very much a part of something like… You know, I had all my crushes at church. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I had my whole little… Yeah. (laughs) I was always excited to go to Korean school on the weekends as I got older. Yeah, yeah, So I could see all my people. Um, But I think I was so lucky in that sense. Uh I I did have a full community. Okay, that's great. I always felt like… So I think I had a very similar upbringing in that sense. What I always struggled with is I felt like I was living a dual life. Mm. Um, Like during the week, it's like my white friends, my school friends. And then on the weekends, it's my Korean friends. And they would never… Overlap, so people are like you have a secret life and you're hiding people from. It's like no, it's like were they like jealous of each other? Not even. They were just like, why don't we know your other friends? I'm like, right. well, I don't want to make you drive an hour outside sure. to go to church with me on the yeah. weekend. Um, and so I always felt like I was cheating on my friends or something. <laughs> um, I was always inviting my white friends. Oh, were you? And my black friends too to church. Uh huh. I was like, there's cute guys here. You can go. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm a little missionary. <laughs> Cute guys and Jesus, you know, we get it all done at the same time. It's perfect. Yeah. Um, okay, so you you grew up in Richmond and then you went to North Carolina. Mm. What was that move like, that transition? That was great too. Because yeah. I was um, super involved in like the like Korean Christian group. Uh-huh. So that was another… Uh, interestingly enough, like I first went to a women's college and I transferred oh, over. Okay. Um, and so, which… that I wasn't super happy at that. Uh huh. Place, but then it was right next to NC State, so uh-huh. all my like um, church guy friends went there. So they would just come pick me up, and I would hang out. Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah. Um. What would What did you study at UNC? Uh, psychology, and then also English and criminal justice. Whoa. So I was like a major and then two minors. So you were like heavily overachieving. Not really. I mean, 
two minors. I mean, I could have been. I could have done more. That's because you're a genius. I could have done more. It's because you're the Asian I J.K. It. Rowling. I, that's one piece of advice I always would want to give to people yeah. in college. Is I feel like I didn't utilize enough of the experience. Really? Like I found my people. I was hanging out. Uh-huh. But I wish I had been in doing like the literary magazine or the newspaper uh-huh. or like just more activities. And I think you kind of take for granted that those, those sort of um, resources are available to you. And then when you leave, you're going, oh, shoot, like. Now I'm in the real world. Yeah, I'm in the real world. And I can't just join up and try and be in a play. Right. You know, like not in the same way. Did you do any extracurriculars as a kid? Like, did you play the violin? Did you do any sports? You know what? Like, I played the piano. Uh Uh-huh. And I sucked. (laughs) I like, I was so bad. It would be so humiliating because every Christmas, the church would have like the pageant. And my mom would always sign me up. I'm like, mom. And I started hating Christmas. Like, I would, (laughs) like in October, I started thinking about it and it would get so like sad because I really didn't want to have to go on stage. Aww. And my mom, you know, you know the Korean, typical Korean where like we didn't, couldn't afford to do piano. So like, this is for you, right? As if it's for me. Right, right. But then. <laughs> they live vicariously through exactly. us. Exactly. By then, forcing things But then there us. were people at my church who were so like good. Uh-huh. Like Jessica Lee went to <laughs> Juilliard or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like, and yeah, she was like 12. Yeah, yeah. And then I was older than her and my mom would still make me get up there and do the piano. And I would literally be like, hot cross. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? Like the and then my mom, God bless her, would be just like You do you, you, Jenny. She was so proud, like as if I was good. But I wasn't. Oh, your mom must be must be so sweet, like so encouraging. My mom was very just like, you're horrible. She's my we had very different Asian moms. (laughs) My mom's like, everything you do is like, oh, you're so good. Oh, that's amazing. I always said, like, mom. Why can't you be more like my American friend moms? Because mm. she'd be like, you're not like, your piano's not good. You're not good at cello. Look at, <laughs> look at Michael and look at Christine and look at how they're at Allstate and doing the governor honors program. I was like, well, I'm not that good, mom. And she's like, clearly. Were you good like at school? Like a smart like, kid? Were you like honors, n- APs? No. I mean, I was in APs. I had honors classes, but I was never the smartest. I was never the smartest. I was never the best at anything. And that drove my mom insane. And was, she was like, how can you not be the best? I was like, I suck at everything. Mom, leave me alone. But now look at you. I know. Now I'm doing, now it's like I'm amazing. talking to you. You're and amazing. I'm doing the best podcast in the world. So like, this is a big deal. Um, yeah, my mom still has moments of like, why, like, why are you doing this? Like, why do you have this job? I'm like, can you please just accept me? I mean, my mom still will be like, you know what? What if that, What if you were like a professor? Like, <laughs> like I'm like, mom, I don't, I mean, no. Because friends of mine who teach uh-huh. in colleges, she's like, you could be doing that too. I'm like, I don't, I'm good right now. You're good. You're yeah, doing I'm great. Good. You're doing Things a, are going well. Yeah. But she still would love for me to be a professor. Right, right. They, I think parents always want stability. Yeah. And they think professor, lawyer, whatever is the most stable. As opposed and to, I also think that Korean culture, I don't know, still has that feeling of like scholars or right, like sort of right. um, kind upper. Of hierarchical. Yeah, like high class people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> high class people. High class people. Teaching things to kids. <laughs> um, so you went to UNC, you studied psychology mm-hmm. and English criminology. Mm-hmm. Criminal justice, yep. Oh my gosh. Um, and then you moved to New York. Yeah. You went straight to New York or how did that I work was out? then applying for grad programs and jobs and stuff and uh-huh. working at my mom's store to uh-huh. still help out. Uh-huh. Yeah, it was um that was certainly an experience. Because you know in high school, I don't know if your parents were like this. Did they either of them have a store or no? No, they did not. Okay, so you're not one of the store kids. I, I was not a store kid. Okay, so like the store kids. Please tell like, us about the store. The like, store kids is like generally, I think there's two different like subsets of um, the way you are a store kid. Some of them, you have to be doing it all the time and like helping out. And uh-huh. some of them are like, you can't, don't, you're just supposed to study, uh-huh. you know? And so I was just supposed to study. Uh-huh. So I didn't really like help out except for doing the grocery shopping and stuff. Like I would okay. help out with that. Yeah. However, then when I was done studying and I was helping, then it was like this. this really you should hard. be here. All well, it's just like, and it's good. I wanted to help. Uh-huh. But it was inside of a um, retirement community. So the clientele uh, was all really elderly people. And, um, you know, it's like… Not the most poppin' place. <laughs> you know? Not at all. <laughs> not at all. Was that, what is that like working in a retirement community? Well, weirdly, I've always had a real um, like affinity for um, 
older communities. Okay. Let's just say, because my grandparents lived with us. Oh, okay. My okay. mom had that store. Um, I volunteered at a nursing home in college. Okay. And so that actually ends up in a lot of my books. Um, oh. In To All the Boys of Love before, uh, she volunteers at like a nursing home, like a mm-hmm. retirement community. And I've always just been really drawn to peop- older people's stories. Mm-hmm. I'm so curious. And I think I was particularly hungry for it as a child of immigrants because, you know, growing up in America, you get really curious about what the American experience was right. like in the 50s and the 60s. Right. And, like. I would go to my friend's house and I'd be like asking the mom and be like, where were you when JFK was shot? <laughs> you know? And I would just want to like chill with her. Yeah. And my friend would be like, come upstairs. Like, what are you doing? And I'm yeah. like, no, no, I just want to know more about this. Uh-huh. And, you know, I think hearing people's stories is so valuable. And yeah. that's what's interesting to me about hanging out with older people. No, I find that completely valid. I remember I, when I was a kid, um, they called me like the little reporter in my neighborhood because Cute. I would… I would go around like every house just to like talk to parents. Be like, what's going on? <laughs> and they were like, why Why is this like eight-year-old talking to us about like school politics? I'm like, I don't know. And, but for me, because I'm the oldest, my parents can speak English very right. well. And so everything was expected to be done on my own. And so when everybody has their parents going to teacher conferences… Sure. I was there like translating and like having to explain yes, everything. Yes, boy. Yes. Right? Yes. And so, and then like field trips and paper forms, like they have no idea what it is. There's always stress involved with that. Right. And so for that, I was like, okay, well, I need to go and get street smart with my neighborhood so that like I can figure out how to survive in this community. Um, what was, Did you the have same, that? Right. Total okay. same. See? Yeah. I was always the favorite of all the friends. Like, you know what I mean? The, <laughs> yeah. the moms would be like, you're my favorite. <laughs> I'm like, thank you. But it was it was just like that. And I remember, you know, my mom had a store. And so she would sometimes come home like pretty late. And I remember mm-hmm. on Thanksgiving. You remember how as a kid you, like there's all these activities leading up to Thanksgiving where you're right. like, making the turkey hand right. and like doing plays and stuff. And I've, I'm a big, I'm into cooking. I've always been into cooking. Mm-hmm. And I remember, um, my mom got the turkey. Everything was going to be all set to go, right? She goes to work. And then she comes back home. And I'm like, what time is like, the turkey going to be ready? When are we eating? And she had forgotten to put the turkey in the oven. Because you know, Korean people don't cook turkey. We don't do turkey. And it's hours long. It's yeah. an hour long affair. And I remember crying so hard and like throwing myself into my mom's bed. And just be like, everything is ruined. It's all ruined. And then my mom felt so bad that she went to her neighbor's house and got me a plate. And then I was like, st- like I literally was in her room just like eating it by myself. <laughs> mm, I got my turkey. Like literally, like just like eating it so like a golem, like you know what I mean, like so like selfishly. Oh my <laughs> and my sister didn't get a plate. It was just me eating by myself in her room. But it was those kind of like you put that significance on these childhood things where you're like, oh, it's really important. Halloween needs to go a certain way, or like Thanksgiving, and it's like not their fault. They don't know. Right. You know what I mean? They're doing the best they can do. But when you're like seven years old, it feels like a really big loss. It feels like a personal attack. And and, and you understand. It's like they don't… They've never done it. They've never done it. Like, and it's like we're the first child as well. Yes. So and like, then we're, and we're sort of like setting the pathway right. for our siblings in many ways too. Right, right, to make right. it cool for them. It's like now we're all good for Thanksgiving. Absolutely. Like, Halloween's going… Smoothly. Right. Everything's… <laughs> right. Everybody's got their costumes, got their gifts… Is not left out at school. Exactly. And I was like, put all the candy. Grandma has to sit mm-hmm. at the door with a candy. We can't be the house that doesn't have a candy. Right. We want to be a cool house. <laughs> You're not the one that smells just like chap chai and kurgogi all the time. I never minded that part. I loved it. But they're like, there's like, we want that jap chai? I'm like, what? Okay, come over. And they're like, we want seaweed. And uh, Sometimes they just want a bowl of rice with some soy sauce right. they would want. I don't get that. No, I don't get that. We're telling you to you now, if you're doing rice with just soy sauce, you're doing it wrong. No. I keep my… I like don't say it when people do it in front of me, but I'm like, that's so wrong. It's whack. Like, what you can do is <laughs> a, a sunny side up egg. Yeah, you Delicious. can do an egg. A little bit of sesame oil. Right. Some, you know, then you can do some soy sauce. Right. A little butter. Yeah, but if it's just soy sauce… No. That's an atrocity. Mm-mm. That is an affront Mm-mm. to the rice people. Don't so, do uh, don't do it. I'm just letting you know. A little spam. Oh, yeah. Perfect. You know, great. So you graduate. You go home. You help your parents for a little bit. A little bit. And then what happens? And then I ended up getting into this master's program for writing, Mm -hmm. creative writing. And I moved to New York. Mm. And And I never left. You never left. Mm -hmm. And you loved it. To New York always was like a mattress. It was like the logistical things. Or I'm like, like, 
yeah, I would love to do an internship in New York, but how am I going to afford to work for free? Right. And then where am I going to get a bed from? And uh-huh. like, you know what I mean? Just those kind of things. Right. And then because I was doing the grad program, I lived in the dorm and I was an RA. So that was all set. But I think those kind of things can get in your head about right. making that big of a move somewhere. Right. I mean, in many ways, there's so many people, but you also feel so alone, especially if you're not from New York. Sure. So it's very daunting. Yeah. I imagine. Um, so you went for creative writing. Um, did you always want to be a writer? Was that I, the dream? Was that the goal? You know what? It wasn't that I always wanted to be a writer. It's that I always was a writer. Oh, okay. Like I was always writing stories, reading books. Um, and I just never knew that it was possible, honestly. Uh-huh. Like I never met a writer. Uh-huh. You know, when you look at the backs of books and you see the pictures of the authors, uh-huh. it was always, always like an older, like white person. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I just never saw that as a possibility because uh-huh. it also seems like and to my parents' credit, they were so supportive of this. Oh. You know, when I went to grad school, it was like I took out loans. And it's kind of nerve-wracking in that sense. Because if I was taking out loans to go to law school or teacher's college or something, right. you know that most likely you'll be able to find a job. Right. But if you get your master's in creative writing, it's like you may or may not. Doesn't, right. You don't have no idea whether or not you'll sell a book. Yeah. But my mom was like, you have a talent. You've got to like go for it. We believe you're going to make it. Uh huh. You know, and she, there was no, if they were worried about it, they didn't tell me. Uh huh. That's amazing. Your mom sounds like such a supportive mom. <laughs> I love my mom, guys. I'm just saying, like, it's just, it's very refreshing, honestly, because for me, like, I think my mom, not that she was not supportive of everything, but like, she's very realistic. Mm, she's very mm-hmm, practical. Mm-hmm. And so even when I called home, I was like, I want to study sociology and history. She was like, Say what? What are you going to do with that? She's like, yeah, what? Right. what is that? Like, history. Like, you just read books. Like, what are you going to do? And I was like, oh, okay. Um, so, to hear that, I mean, because I feel like there's two types of Asian parents. There's mine. They're like, be practical, be realistic. You got to make money kind of thing. And then there are your parents where it's like, we support whatever. Your creative writing, like that kind of thing. I think it was because of, and I think we're talking about two similar things that are just like different sides of the same yeah. coin, which is that being the oldest and being responsible for many things at a young age, they always says, oh, you know better than us. Mm. You know what I mean? So whatever, you always like know the mm-hmm. right thing. Mm-hmm. And so there's immense pressure with that at the same time. Like I always felt like strongly that I knew what was best for me. Uh-huh. And they were supportive of that because they're like, we don't know where right. we're from Korea. Like you know better what, what you can right, do here. Right, right. No, I, I agree with you on that latter point. Definitely. I think when I made the transition to become a singer here, they were like, we don't like it, but like we sure. trust you. Sure. Exactly. And that's that's mm-hmm. that's the thing. It's a it's a big basis on trust. Um so you were always a writer. Um you grew up reading and writing all the time. Like crazy, yeah. What was your like inspiration? Do you remember like some of your earlier works? Like Sure. As a kid, or <laughs> yeah, I won first prize for um, a book called The Dream. The Dream, okay. And it's about a girl who moves to New York City, oh. and her sister is like a brat. <laughs> this is a theme in all my books: is a sister is a brat, and then she wakes up and it was all a dream. So I really gave away the whole plot <laughs> in the title. I still won first prize in my classroom. What? What? How old were you? Uh that was I was seven. Oh, I wow. wrote and illustrated it myself. My next. Foray was called Chris, Santa's Christmas Caper. Okay. And it was all about the, the toys get stolen and um, Santa has to like figure out where they went. So you were, this is from a very young age. You were just always creatively juicing things out. I was. And then as I got older, there's less time for creative uh-huh. pursuits in high school and uh-huh. stuff. But I still was writing my own little like personal fan fiction of my life. Uh-huh. Where it's like me and my friends from church and we like, what's it like when we're in college? <laughs> <laughs> or like we're on a ski trip or here we are at a reunion I feel like you were like writing your future like kind things of. that you wanted to do things that places you wanted to go yeah like you were doing it and you kind of made it happen with your real life as well a little bit that's awesome it's kind of crazy oh. wait can I ask you a question yeah were you like um, praise band leader what was your deal I was not I was a, I was in a praise band for like a few months mm-hmm. um, and it, for me, church was far away. Mm. Like I lived probably 45 minutes, sometimes an hour away from church. And so in order to do that, I would have to go Friday and Saturday sure. and Sunday. Yeah. And so I was I did it for a few months in the summer. I was like, some other time. <laughs> um, but I always had this thing where I was like, I don't know. This can sound really weird. 
But when you're, you know, if you go to church sometimes and you're watching a praise band or like something, you're like, I could do that. I could do that better than you. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you know what? Actually, come to think of it. No, I was never in a praise band because I'm like not a good singer. But I feel like I remember bringing my college friends to my home church one time. Uh They picked me up on the way to school. And like my friend Dan, I remember him being like, I can do that. I'm better than them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's probably like for you, like if you read a piece of bad writing, you're like, this one on an award? I could do that. Do you ever have that? Um, You definitely do. No, you're, no. They're, yes, they're definitely. <laughs> see, that's like the same thing. It's like, I'm at I'm at churches. I'm like, oh, cool. I could definitely do better than that. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't it's know. all the same to God, right? It's all the same to God. He doesn't care. He just, he just, he just, he just, he just loves your it. Intention. Yes. It's the, the truest form of intention. Now, having said that, when you have a bad praise leader, it can really ruin your Sunday. True. <laughs> it can really throw your entire Sunday off. Um, for me, I think because I am a musical person… If I go to church and the praise is bad, mm. like I just feel bad. Mm. I'm like, I feel attacked sonically. <laughs> Do you like prefer more contemporary or more traditional? I prefer more contemporary, but if it's going to be bad contemporary, I'd rather just be traditional. traditional. Yeah. yeah. I'd rather just do a hymn where it just repeats the same melody yeah. 30 times than then have to listen to your web oh, Jesus. <laughs> I will walk out and then I'll come back in <laughs> for the sermon. <laughs> I can't. I really can't. Um, God, I just shared a little too much, but that's fine. We can cut it. We can, no, we're gonna put that out there. Um, so you go to New York, you graduate. Um, what did you do after you graduated? Well, I sold my book while I was in school. Oh, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, so that was very fortunate uh-huh. for me. My yeah. path was was uh, like a, a fortunate path. Man, what? So what year were you in grad school? Was it like towards the end or like? No, actually, it was like. Right. So you like didn't even need to go to grad school. (laughs) You could have just been like, I'm done. (laughs) Well, it was, you know, what it was, was knowing that I had to submit pages Uh every week, Uh learning how to receive criticism, Uh give criticism. I think it's, I don't think you need to go to grad school. I don't think that's like necessary. However, I think it is necessary to learn how to um, get critical feedback Uh and, and say like to take in you know, the note underneath the note too. Uh-huh. Like they might, they could be like, you should do this. And you're like, mm, I don't want to do that. But you can sense that something isn't working with what right. you're doing. And figure it out yeah. in your own sense. Yeah. Yeah. What, who or what really inspired you in terms of writing? Not only like topically or thematically, but like were there particular authors or figures in your life? Or I mean, I just read everything. You know yeah. what I mean? And yeah. just, I would go to the library every single day after school because my mom um, couldn't pick me up from work until like after she closed the store. So I would just be there for hours. Mm-hmm. So I read the whole like teen section and I was like reading like most of the adult section <laughs> at a young age. I was uh-huh. there for like four hours every day. Oh my gosh. So I was reading like Goosebumps and like Animorphs. Those are fun. They were great. Did you read like Babysitter's Club? Yeah, I love Babysitter's Club. And- yeah, there's gonna be a TV show. Did you hear that? I did not know On that. On Netflix, yeah. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Um, what else did you read? So I read, I definitely read Baby Source Club. I read all the Stephen King books. Oh, wow. I was going a little bit. That's like a. <laughs> <laughs> I was like nine years old and I'm reading like um, <laughs> it. And I'm like, what is What's happening? <laughs> like, what is this? Uh-huh. But then I was like, okay, I mean, just like storytelling is so good. Yeah. Um, I think I have a theory that like before young adult as a genre like existed. Yeah. It was pretty much like Stephen King was that uh-huh. kind of um, gateway into older books because he wrote about young people so beautifully. Mm-hmm. I and mean, he continues to write about young people so beautifully. Um, he's still with us. Right. But <laughs> I just admire that. That he, and what he's so great at is um, taking it seriously. Mm-hmm. He doesn't, it's not like, I think some people approach um, content for younger people as if it's it's not as important or you don't have the same respect for it. And I think his storytelling was all the same if it was adults, if it was kids, whatever mm-hmm. it was. Mm-hmm. So your first book was a book called Shug. Shug. Mm-hmm. Shug. And Shug Knight. Shug Knight. Okay, and you wrote that in college. Yes. You also, your second book was Clara Lee and the Apple Pie Dream. Yes, it was. Well, is that about? That's about, it's actually sort of like a, a a love letter to my grandpa. Oh, okay. We were really, really close. Uh-huh. Um, and he and my grandma live with us. Uh-huh. So the story is about... Um, a little girl who's really close to her grandpa uh-huh. and um, her bratty little sister. My favorite person in the world. <laughs> okay. 
But, um, you know, she has inspired me a lot. Uh-huh. Like Kitty and To All the Boys is definitely, there's a lot of inspiration from my sister. Uh-huh. Is she living in New York as well? Or? No. Okay. But you guys stay in touch. Yes. And that's good. Um, that's funny. Um, is there a reason you, you, you were doing children's books or? You know, I think I've always been drawn to coming of age stories. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, the first time is to me as a storyteller, the most like narratively compelling time, mm-hmm. you know, and the middle you forget most of. And the last time you never really know if it's going to be the last time, mm-hmm. you know, but the first time that you fall in love or the first time that you have your heart broken, all that stuff just sticks with you mm-hmm. your whole life. People right. don't forget that. Right. You know, and people forget a lot of the middle stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just find that to be interesting. Not to say that I wouldn't do stories about other ages or whatever, right. but that's kind of like a home base for me. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Um, and it clearly, clearly is Asian mm-hmm. in this book. Um, I feel like at that point, and maybe even now, there's still a lack of representation when it comes to just Asian characters mm-hmm, in general. Mm-hmm. Was that a very cognizant, like, intentional thing for Absolutely. you? Absolutely. I mean, nobody wanted to publish that book. Really? Yes. And that, you know, like, that, it was like, I would hear, I remember talking to somebody who um, was a higher up. I won't say where. <laughs> and she was like, and she was Asian, uh-huh. but she was like, don't, people don't want to buy, read books about Asian kids. That's so crazy. I know. She was like, they don't want to do it. And I was like, well, I'm still doing it. Uh-huh. And she's like, well, it's, it's like a numbers game. People, it's not going to sell. Mm-hmm. And then it'll be a flop. And <sighs> just know that. And so I was like, I don't really care. Honestly, I was like, I don't care if it's a flop. I just care that the kids who need it, get it. So even if it's like only a couple hundred kids who see the book, right. then I'm willing to just do it for that mm-hmm. reason. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to harp too much on this topic because I feel like it's such a hot topic and you've probably talked about it a billion times. But when it comes to representation and Asians in media um, and whatever platform it is, um, how have you seen it really change over the past few years uh, throughout your career? And well, do you, you know, what do you kind of see in the future? For it. I think I've always tried to be really thoughtful and strategic about things uh-huh. because um, from that experience with Clara Lee, knowing that people weren't going to say yes to it, and eventually right. someone did say yes to uh-huh. it, um, wanting to get to a place where I can do whatever I want mm-hmm. and people will want to buy it. And then mm-hmm. I think when you gain the trust of readers to say, like, listen, this might not be the story that I'm used to or... Um, that feels familiar to me, but because I like trust you and I like your stuff, then I'll go for Give it. Give a chance. And yeah. I felt like with To All the Boys, that yeah. was definitely, for me, I thought the story has a lot of like effervescence to it. It has a lot of um, just like lightness mm-hmm. that people I think will be drawn to this character. And even if you subconsciously don't want to read books about people of color. And I think people, a lot more people don't than people realize because, I'll, I'll start it over. Okay, I think… Yeah subconsciously people think when they see a book cover with a non-white person, people think it's going to be like a more of a tough read. And mm-hmm. they're like, Oh, I just want to re- be at the beach and like have a light read right. because for so long stories about people of color have been all about our pain. And, right. um, this, that's what people want is like our pain. Our, like, how is it so hard the to struggle. be like a- Asian or how is it so hard, uh, to be, you know, a uh, black American and then it's mm-hmm. like a slave story or it's a story about um, you know I'm like embarrassed about the food that I bring to school mm. and that's the kind of things that people would publish because that's what the assumption was that everything was going to be that mm-hmm. sad story right? and I just think this should be all kinds of stories where you could just have a story about a girl um, falling in love for the first time or whatever mm-hmm. and the story isn't just about being Asian like it's a mm-hmm. part of her identity but it's mm-hmm. not the whole right. of her identity right and that's what I think I I personally really loved about To All the Boys. I think I, I told you when we first met, you know, my brother and I, we we got home, we're like, let's watch something on Netflix, turned it on, and it was just like the first thing that I was like, oh, let's give it a try. And for us, it was, oh, there's an Asian girl. Let's try it. And we watched the entire thing in silence for like two hours and we ended and we literally just looked at each other. It's like, that was great. That's like literally all. And he goes, Yeah, that was really good. And we were like, we're I'm like 30, am I allowed to like this kind of thing? <laughs> like, um, but we really liked it. And I think 
what I liked so much was that it was just a love story. It had very little to do with the fact that Lana or the character is Asian. There were little hints of it like of the Yakurta and like the little things of being Asian. But it felt so normal. And that's what I think we need now. Just like we're not exoticized. We're not in pain. We celebrate life just the way it is. Just like humans. Yeah. Right? And I think to me it was it was like I want people to know that there's many different ways to look as an all-American girl. It's mm-hmm. not just one way. Mm-hmm. You know? So people I think that's just to me the takeaway is that we're all like just humans. And I'm hoping I mean I think I was so happy that the movie did well. I just hope it'll continue to like open more doors for people, you know, mm-hmm. and so we get different kinds of things. Like, I want to see our pain, too. I want to see everything. Right. Right. And I want to see, you know, different kinds of um, Asian stories and, like, oh, whatever. Like, that's the hope is that you can't have one movie be bearing the burden to tell oh, everybody's yeah. story. It's right. just, like, not possible. And right. then I think specificity is what makes a story good. Uh-huh. Right. Is that it feels like this person's story. Right. But if you try to tell everybody's story, you're not going to be telling a good story. Yeah, absolutely. I agree wholeheartedly. I think it's, that's probably, you know, I'd say to all the boys and Crazy Rich Asians last year, they were just massive in terms of just getting Asians out there and like representation and like hopefully in terms of casting and like future slates for production, it probably really moved the needle on. And I think for some people who critiqued either movie or any Asian character out there, you know, there's always the thing of, well, that's not me. Right. Like, yes, well, it doesn't have to be you. There are billions of Asians in the world. There are billions of stories. So not everything is going to relate to you directly. In the same way, Crazy Rich Asians did not do well in Asia. Because in Asia, that story just didn't connect with people. Well, I think because in Asia, people are used to seeing themselves in the screen. Way, yeah. And then we were like, I mean, I definitely teared up mm-hmm. at the theater when I saw it. Right. Just out of like, wow, like, it's cool. To see this many Asian people right. in a movie in America. Mm-hmm. It felt like a, a, a moment. A momentous yes. kind of occasion. Yeah, yes. for sure. Absolutely. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about To All the Boys then. Um, I read that it took a few years for it to get sold and into production. Um, was that just like the craziest experience of… You know, it's funny because I think… Things have accelerated. In some ways, it's taken so long. In uh-huh. some ways, the movement like accelerated really quickly. Uh-huh. Um, where, you know, Oscar So White happened um, on Twitter, the hashtag, right. um, with um, Reign of April. Um, and that made people talk about stuff in a way that uh-huh. people had not been talking. And uh-huh. I think a lot of times people can look down on Twitter movements and say, it's just a hashtag and like, what are you doing? Well, that was doing a lot because suddenly, right. you know, her work as an activist got so many articles, you know, mm-hmm. everywhere. And people were talking about, like, whoa, this is something that we haven't really considered the way we right. should. And it kind of shamed people, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that helped a lot. I think that that was... So when I was first trying to sell it as a movie, that was pre-Oscar So White. And um, people did not understand... It didn't even occur to them that she should be Asian. Literally did not occur to them. Even though I'm Asian, the character's Asian, the book cover... As an Asian girl, um, I would talk about casting and then they would be naming like white actresses. Uh And I was like, oh, but she's Asian. And then one producer said to me like, well, you know, I feel like as long as the like she gets the spirit of the character and then the age and like ethnicity and race, that doesn't matter as long as Uh the spirit is there. I'm like, the spirit... Uh It's Asian American. Asian American. Yeah. So like that <laughs> spirit. <laughs> and so I had to say no a bunch of times. Uh-huh. I said no many times uh-huh. throughout the process. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not something I like talk about all that much. Uh-huh. I guess it's come up definitely during um the press of the movie and stuff, but it was it was it was like sort of disheartening in many ways uh-huh. to have it not be understood of why that was uh-huh. a problem. Well, I, you know, I'm I'm so glad that you're there vocalizing, like, the importance of it being Asian American, and you're probably the, one of the few people who are able to say, like, light, like, guided in the right way, so it's true to Asian American experiences and identity. Um, so thank you for doing that. Oh, I think mean, well, that's incredibly important. I mean, thanks. <laughs> thanks. I mean, it's not, I definitely had moments where I said to people, like, I don't really need I'm fine doing what I'm doing with my books or whatever. Uh-huh. I don't need 
to have like a movie uh-huh. to that degree. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. and I think for an author, a movie is always the dream because the movie is basically just a commercial for your books, uh, right? Right. And so that's great, but like, I don't need that that badly to where I'm going to take something that isn't true to what the story was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about the casting real quick. So, Lana Condor. Did I pronounce that right? It's Lana. Lana. Lana Condor and Noah Centineo. 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 <laughs> Man, I'm really killing it with these pronunciations. <laughs> Lana Condor and Noah Centineo. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I assume you guys have gotten really close through three it's been, movies. Well, it's sort of like camp in a way. You uh-huh. know what I mean? Where, and this is my first time being on movie sets, and especially for like this long periods of time. And... Um, actually getting to produce, uh-huh. like, you get into a mentality of all that matters right now is the thing that we're making, mm-hmm. and you get so tight within your, like, crew. Yeah. Which I'm I'm sure it must be similar in ways with, like, movie, I mean, with music making. Yeah. Music, yeah. Where you're just all trying to make something good. Common cause. Yeah. yeah. And then, so everyone from, and that's what I really appreciated the most was from people from Transpo who are driving, you know, me to set every day and Lana... Um, you were going, wow, like every person's role is really important and everyone's mm-hmm. taking it seriously. Mm-hmm. And for me, that was so humbling. Um, like I got like teary eyed a couple of times uh-huh. just by seeing all the people that are working on this, who've been working on this and who respect the material mm-hmm. to that degree where they're going to like treat it, you know, with so much care. Right. Um, so yeah, you have an amazing cast, amazing crew, amazing team behind the entire thing. You're now wrapping it up. Have there been tears? There's definitely been tears. Yeah. There have definitely been a lot of tears. Oh, on your behalf or on everybody's? Everybody tears? cries. Uh-huh. I think Noah's night, there were a lot of tears. I wasn't there. Um, I saw everyone's like videos. Uh-huh. Uh, I was sad to have missed it. But um, it'll be a wrap on the whole thing really soon. I think when you go a wrap on all three movies, it just feels like almost like a TV show because it's been... Right. A few years. A few, like, yeah, of, of time together. And um, it'll be, I think it'll be probably emotional this week because mm-hmm. we're wrapping this week. Yeah. Um, I'm so, it's the third one. Is, that's that has still, not been announced or I don't even think decided yet. Okay. So still working on it. Yeah. Um, what was it? Did you personally get to choose Lana and Noah or like were you involved in that process? So I, um, had given them like names early on mm-hmm. and Lana was definitely like my top choice so oh, okay. I kept on like what about Lana uh-huh. and there was one moment where I even on my Instagram I put up a picture of her uh-huh. um, that was like a really cute photo of her like wearing a headband and sitting at like a soda fountain looking really 1960s and um, I posted it just kind of like to inception yeah. a little bit because people yeah. were like oh my god she'd be a cute Laura Jean and I'm like right? Really? <laughs> you What? You know and to get just pe- get her in people's right Atmosphere. At that point, she had been in X Men right, as she Jubilee. Had been, yeah. Um, and but, but she hadn't been anything else yet, and so I just kind of was like putting her on my fans' radar at least right. for Lara Jean. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kept bringing her up to the producers and stuff too. But uh-huh. I think um, people they they ask for your input mm-hmm. or whatever, and I've gotten more, um, you know, of a say as mm-hmm. I've been working more as producer, but. Generally, you know, you when you sell your book, life rights <laughs> in perpetuity. It's like then you they get to make their version of mm-hmm. of it, and that's their vision mm-hmm. of what that's going to be. And I think for me, I don't feel particularly um, in my feelings about mm-hmm. that part of it because I do think the book is the book, and that will always exist mm-hmm. as the book. Mm-hmm. And that's you know, I think. For readers, whatever your movie is in your own head is going to be the best movie. Yeah. You know, imagination. You, is your imagination is going to make it right. amazing. Um, but then the movie is going to be the filmmaker's vision in their minds. Right. And so it's just kind of like accepting that there's different um, sort of versions mm-hmm. of the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I I never really thought about it that way. It's It is really as a reader— as you read it, you're picturing like I do a thing where I start reading a book and I like literally make a mental image of mm-hmm. who this person is, and this person is just like doing all the actions in mm. it. Um, and so I don't know, maybe I'm just. I hope I'm not the only one. I don't think you're that. the only one. I right. don't do that personally. Uh-huh. Physically, it's never that um, important to me. It's uh-huh. more like I can see like a vague thing. outline of yes, a person, but it's really more internal that I, uh-huh. I, I'm in deep. Okay, cool. Um, so, yes, yeah, so now you're wrapping it up. What's next for you? Like, what's... 
I'm sure you have a billion projects. I'm sure you have like crazy offers. Are you any new books coming out? Like what's going I'm on? I'm really busy. Yeah. Of stuff I can't talk about. Oh, so many <laughs> secrets. That's good yeah. though. That's really good. That's I a great sign. Yeah. I personally feel like in my writing and also just in life, it's nice to keep um, whatever you're working on as close to you for as long as you can. Mm-hmm. Um, because you don't, you don't know what it's going to be yet. And I think it, has all the possibility in the world mm-hmm. when you're still creating it. Mm-hmm. But if you show something too soon, then people like have an opinion about it or Feedback idea. And you and- kind of just want to make what you're going to make. And then and then people can like it or not like it. Right. But I think it's important to be really protective of your creative mm-hmm. process. Okay, fair enough. Well, I'm excited to see whatever Thank comes you. next. We'll share it off camera. <laughs> and you guys can be jealous because you have no idea. I'll tell you everything. <laughs> yes. Um... It's, you know, also very well known and I've also heard through you personally and through friends that you are a big K drama fan. Oh yeah. What's your favorite oh, all time K drama? Oh Lord. I know I'm gonna put you, put all, you in that all position. time. I'm doing some like old blood uh-huh. <laughs> K dramas like Samsuni I love. Okay, Samsuni. Yeah. That was wait, when it's was old that? School. Diane, you like that? Yeah. Yeah. It's old school. I I love like that and then like um Memories of Bali, which is really old school, which is like the K drama of all K dramas, where it's kind of like there's a murder, there's like there's everything <laughs> happening. There's like yeah, it's really dramatic. Uh-huh. Um, with um, oh my favorite guy, Choi Zhang. Okay. Yeah, he's okay, like okay. my dude. Um, and then uh, I also love of more recent times. I loved like um, Answer Me, nineteen ninety seven. Uh huh. Great. Um, Great I one. loved. I, I, what else have I watched really recently? Oh, uh, Alone in Love. Alone in Love. Yeah, it's a, like a more of a deep cut. Okay, it's I don't a know that more one. More grown yet. up one. Okay. Um and but old school Coffee Prince for sure. Um, Kung, I love. Um, <laughs> you watched all of them. <laughs> I've watched almost like, I, I have a list, a little word doc of uh-huh. all of the ones I've watched because uh-huh. I broke my ankle, um, one year and then I was Ouch. laid up for like a long time. Oh, Boys Over Flowers, of course, uh-huh. of course. Uh, where I've watched a full like month and a half straight of dramas. Wow. You know what I mean? Like I, of my life. Wow. Of if it was like back to back hours. Yeah. Now I think I've watched like 35 dramas. Wow. We, you should write an encyclopedia. I know. On K-dramas. I have a lot of like thoughts. Or like you should do a, you should do a podcast on K-dramas. I mean. And just talk people through it. There's a, a great website called Drama Beans. That I everyone no knows if you were into Drama the, Beans. Yeah. yeah Drama Beans. You should run it. It's very addictive. <laughs> it's already well run. Um, if you could write a K drama, mm. what would the what would the opening scene be? Whoa, opening scene! I probably would want to do one, a high school one. A high school, you know one. what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, set in like Busan, where my family is from. Uh-huh. That's probably why I like Answer Me Nineteen Ninety Seven so okay. much. Yeah. Um. I have to say, like, in, as evidenced by To All The Boys, I do love, like, contract dating as a trope uh-huh. in K-dramas. Okay. It's a common trope. Because um, it's, like, really nice when you have two people who would never end up together, who have get stuck together. Right. So that could be because you're stuck in a house together, like, in full house uh-huh. with that contract. It could be because you're, like, you know, working together and you have to pretend, like, um, what is that, Big Love? Where they know. have to pretend they were a couple. You know what I mean? All the pretending stuff is so fun. Because then you have like the constant conflict. Constant and conflict. Things, you've yeah. got the like this story happening, and then you've got the like the underneath story. The happening. undercurrents. Of yeah, where that's like going their true on. feelings are starting to like bubble up. They develop, and how do they show that? I like the fighting ones too. I can't wait for the day you do a K drama. Oh my God, that would be a dream come true. I will watch Truly from beginning to end. A dream come true because I mean, my one note of criticism uh-huh. of the K drama is that sometimes I feel like it goes too long and it feels like the story could be wrapped up sooner. Right. But it's going and going and then someone always goes to Italy or France. Yeah, and that's the end. Or some, and then they come back in seven years. And, and that drives me crazy. amount of time they've yeah. been gone. Yeah. So it's like the tension goes up, 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 up and then it kind of like flatlines and, and then it goes up, up, uh, flat lines. Yeah. What was it? Uh, I didn't the, watch that one. You don't watch that mm-hmm. one? I think like in that one too it's like he disappears and he comes. I was like, what the heck? Like, again? Like, you guys can go with a better head. Just kill somebody off. Like, maybe I'm just very extreme in that sense. But I agree with you, all to say. Um, I feel like people who 
have heard the name Jenny Han or maybe listen to this podcast or love the movie or your books, there are there is a 20, 30 year old, no, not 30 year old. There's like a 20 year younger Jenny Han somewhere. Hmm. You know, there's people Hello. who who look to you <laughs> as inspiration and can say, I want to be like her. And I want to write a great novel or a great book and a movie or whatever. Like, what do you have as words of enger- encouragement or advice to them? Um, I think I would say that what makes you unique is your your voice and your the way that you look at the world, mm-hmm. your point of view. And I think it would be about really honing in on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I'm sure that must go for music as well. It's like mm-hmm. what makes you special is right. It's not about the best voice or best style or best songwriting. It's really about how you are able to bring people into your world and mm-hmm. make them see through your eyes right. and feel connection. And that's all I ever want to do is is to have someone read a story that I'm telling and feel like they can connect to the characters, mm-hmm. you know, and it feels real to them. Uh-huh. So I think that's the advice I would give would, is just to really work on that, um, on understanding what your point of view is. And, and that means, I think, reading a lot and mm-hmm. watching a lot of stories and listening to music and listening to people and really being like um, somebody who's empathic, mm-hmm. you know, and what's it like to walk in that person's shoes? Yeah. It's, it's so much of, of storytelling. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, no, I... Uh, empathy. Empathy. Underlying, the big keyword for today is empathy. empathy. Yeah. Which is, I love that word. I just feel like people don't think about it enough. Yeah, and I think I'll say that as much um, struggle there is with being a kid of, of immigrants mm-hmm. and things that you go through and trying to like help out their parents and like mm-hmm. language barriers and stuff, I think you do develop almost like a superpower in the sense of being hyper attuned to people around you and like, you know, like um, just sensing a mood. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Your mm-hmm. nunchi, like, I think really, nunchi. like, develops super acutely. Right. Because you're having to sort of go back and forth between different cultures. Right. And understanding, like, what it's like at home and at school and with these parents' friends versus the Korean parents' friends right. and all that. And I think that's something that would serve you really well as a storyteller. Mm. Because you're already really picking up on um, other people's, like, emotions and, and, like, vibes. It's like a sixth sense almost. Yeah. In that mm-hmm. sense. Um, cool. Uh, this is, I have just a few more questions. Um, I guess like what is, what is a dream for you? What do you have like an end goal or like, I don't know. When you look back on your life, at a certain point, is there something more that you want to achieve or like you want to be or anything like mm. that? Wow. I don't know. I don't know. I think this is all the stuff that's happened has been beyond my wildest dreams. You know, of being able to help make a movie and all that stuff. It's been like crazy. It's been amazing. Um, I would want to keep on telling stories um, and keep on feeling connected to people, I Mm -hmm. guess. Mm -hmm. Um, I have definitely an interest in like aesthetic and so I would want to, I don't know, that's part of what's exciting to me about filmmaking too is is being able to make worlds come to life. Mm -hmm. You know, so sure, like I'm into like stationery and books and like <laughs> home design and <laughs> like I like design uh-huh. so that's that would be a cool uh-huh. thing for me to explore into a little uh-huh. bit um, which I get to do all that when I write my stories right Right. like I think when you read to all the boys you don't think about um, on, at first glance you wouldn't think about what is her wardrobe like what does her world look like because it's contemporary realistic right and mm-hmm. so I think people assume okay for Harry Potter for Hunger Games we got a like a certain look we know exactly right. what we're doing and so People put less thought into how it should look uh-huh. when it's contemporary realistic because you're going, it's just my world. Right. But I think it's also important to make you understand who the character is. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think being able to do more of that in different ways uh-huh. would be exciting to me. Okay, cool. Well, I look forward to seeing interior designer <laughs> Jenny Han in, in the coming years. So to kind of start wrapping things up, mm-hmm. we have a little segment for you. Mm. Um, where we're going to make you choose your most iconic pairs. Okay. 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 So the way it works is, for example, we're going to give you Ross and Rachel of Friends mm-hmm. or Edward and Bella of Twilight. And we're going to make you choose. I know, you, you. your face just looked very pained. Well, I am actually 
a Rachel and Joey person. Which a probably, Rachel and Joey person. That will get me in trouble, I know. If you talk about friends on uh, social media, people uh-huh. feel so strongly about certain pairings and uh-huh. stuff. And I, I'm, I'm a Rachel Joey. Rachel can I say and that? Joey. We can say that, but you still have to pick here. Ross and Rachel. Oh my gosh, you're so and strict. Bella. I know. Uh, fine. I guess I'll go Edward and Bella. Edward and Bella. Okay. Edward and Bella. Edward and Bella versus Mario and Princess Peach from Nintendo. Oh. I'll go Mario and Princess Peach. Okay, Mario and Princess Peach mm-hmm. versus Carrie and Big in Sex in the City. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, Aiden is in our movie. He's a dad. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So that's funny. But I'll go Carrie and Big. Okay, Carrie and Big versus Jim and Pam of The Office. I'll go Carrie and Big. Carrie and Big versus... Kim Jandi and Ku Junpyo of Boys Whoa! Over Flowers. K drama. Oh, I gotta go with Jandi. Jandi, yeah, okay. Jandi yeah. and Jun. Is Jun-pyo. it Junpyo, Jun-pyo, right? Jandi yeah. and Junpyo. Ku like, Junpyo! Yeah. Jandi <laughs> <laughs> and Junpyo of Boys Over Flowers. Yeah. Versus Elizabeth Bennett and Mr. Darcy of Pride and Prejudice. Oh. Wait, the Colin Firth, Jennifer Gilly version, or just like. No, just the book. Period. Period. I gotta go with them. Okay. Yeah. Elizabeth Bennett and Mr. Darcy against Romeo and Juliet. Elizabeth. Okay. Elizabeth and Darcy versus Noah Calhoun and Allie Hamilton of The Notebook. Uh, I'm sticking with my okay. Mr. Darcy. All right. So uh, Elizabeth Bennett and Mr. Darcy versus Joey and Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're a sly one. I'm sticking with Elizabeth. And Mr. Darcy. Okay. Yeah. Elizabeth and Darcy versus Lara Jean and Peter Kavinsky. Wow. Wow. You're so evil. I know. We went there. You went there. Well, you know what? I'm sticking with it. <laughs> 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 I'm right. just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm, now I'm being disloyal to my own creation. I mean, you could, we could be like, oh, you're so humble. Or we could so, you know, either way. I, mean, I just think it's iconic. Right. So, Elizabeth and Mr. Wow. Darcy. All right, there you go, you guys. You have it. Um, you're just very humble, you know. <laughs> for a lot of people, for a lot of people who are in a younger generation, it's definitely going to be Lara Jean and Peter. Well, that's really nice, you know. So, Thanks. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us today on this episode. Um, it's been a pleasure. I hope it wasn't too crazy or too painful. No, or... the windows did not break. I know. We're still I was, alive. Honestly, I'm a little disappointed. I wanted to see some rain and like. Be like, ah! <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us. I know you're incredibly busy. You're in the middle of shoots and you made time for us. So thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. This has been amazing. It's been a pleasure. Um, can you tell us where we can find you online or how people can keep up with you? You can find me on Instagram. That's where I'm most active. Okay. At Jenny Han. I'm also on Twitter, but Instagram is like okay. home base. At Jenny Han on Instagram. Um, again, thank you so much to Jenny for joining us. If you guys please go ahead and follow us at The Dive Studios to keep up with upcoming guests and make requests for who you want myself, Eric, to talk to because I like to do that. Um, I'm going to do that. I'm going to make some requests. Please do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for Jenny. Have a, an amazing wrap to your shooting thank here. You. And I can't wait for the next few movies and your books. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good one. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Hey guys, did you guys like that video? Then make sure you guys subscribe to Dive Studios YouTube channel and put your notifications on because we got a lot more great content coming your way. Look at this video. See? Wow. Wow. And this and this is great too. Enjoy.